Aloha, I'm Rasa Priya with Maui Sound Healing, and today we're going to be discussing how to play shamanic gongs. So you might be wondering, well, what, what is so different about, um, what makes shamanic gong shamanic? And that's a great question. Typically, in sound healing, we see a lot of movement towards creating a peaceful state, bliss, uh, you know, relaxation, move away from anxiety. It's really angelic, really beautiful. Um, oftentimes the bowls and gongs are played together, and that's what we mostly see. Well, those of you who have been to our ceilings know that we do things a little differently. For us, we really feel it's important to go into the shadow areas. In other words, to have, a, to have that peace, it's not just about love and light, but it's actually going into the places that are uncomfortable within the self, really going into those shadow areas taking a look and seeing what's really there authentically. And by doing that practice, we learn to love those parts of ourself. And when we also do that, then we automatically hold space for others afflicted with the same kind of wounding and expressions. So it's a very healing thing to be able to go into the shadows and provide light there. It just, it really helps change the way we relate to one another. We don't get triggered as much. We're able to make decisions we're able to hold space for the wounding of others. That's mostly where all this conflict is happening right now. Uh, somebody acts in a particular way, another person doesn't like it, there's a quarrel, everybody's trying to defend their position and their point of view, but no one's really holding space for the other person. You know, we're, we're wounded here. We came from generations of conditioning, abuse, ignorance, all kinds of things. The way that we treat each other, the way that we treat earth, etc. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to say it's not our fault because, you know, we're all accountable, but we have a long history of a, of a dysfunctional lineage, and hardly any of us were raised in a, in a really good scenario where we could actually learn to be ourselves and giving and loving, etc. We're mostly defending ourselves. So our shamanic work is designed specifically to go into those uncomfortable areas within the self, okay? So... I'm going to give you a little bit of history about um, my practice, just so you kind of get an understanding of where I'm coming from, um, musically and also spiritually. Well, musically, I started playing music when I was about five years old. Um, I had some abuse when I was a young person, so I used to use that as my form of healing. Right off the bat, I would escape uh, getting beat, getting yelled at, humiliated, etc., and I would go and just turn to music, and that would give me a place to be, where I could express myself, I could be myself with someone not hitting me and things. Um, and it was just a, a way to really release that energy and a place to go, a place to go for safety and security. I am now uh, well, oh, I'm much older than that now. And in that time, I've cultivated um, the ability to play about 20 instruments total. Percussion instruments, string instruments, some wood, keyboards, uh, etc. Even the accordion <laughs> and harmonica, things like that. Trombone, even. Anyways, um, I want to say that because I want you to know that I'm a qualified musician. I've studied both classically and uh, in North Indian classical music as well, a very staunch discipline. But out of all those instruments, the guitar, the sarod, some really difficult instruments, one of my favorites is the gong. The reason why is I personally feel with the gong, I could express in ways that I can't do with other things. Other instruments are limited in the things that I want to convey, the, key, the things that I want to uh, promote in, in sound, in sound healing. So the gongs really provide that space. And as far as spiritually, I want, I want, to, I want to give you some um, information only just so you know where I'm coming from and you get an idea. So way back when, I was studying um, a path called Vaishnavism. It's the Vaishnava faith. And I went to India and stayed with my guru. And in the Vaishnava tradition, you know, we, we're supposed to um, honor a certain tradition. It's called the Guru Parampara. And what that means is you honor uh, things in proper succession. In other words, I'm to pray to my teacher who to, who's to pray to his teacher, etc., etc. And it goes through that channel of gurus. 
So it's, it's considered to be very clean by the time it gets to where it wants to be, the message or prayer or whatever. And, um, you know, all the faults, all the, all the stuff that, uh, all the conditioning, etc., is kind of cleansed, so to speak. So that's the, the tradition. What was really unique uh, for me was that amongst that whole tradition, my guru picked me out specifically and told me to do things differently. He basically told me to break rules. I don't want to go into it uh, too much. And I wondered about that. It's like, why, why would he tell me such a thing? Why would he instruct me in such a way when we know that that's not the traditional um, way of doing things? And I was worried about that for, for some years. I would talk to my wife at the time, and I, we couldn't figure it out. Like I, I thought, gosh, am I so fallen that I have to do this practice? Um, what, what is going on here? You know, I never felt very qualified in my spiritual progress. In fact, this is a funny story. When I went to India and stayed at the temple, the first thing I do, I did was I locked myself in a room and refused to come out. I wanted to go stay with the pigs because I felt so unqualified. It was a very horrific, horrific feeling. I felt like I had made some progress here in the West, but when I saw what was in the East, when I went to the temples, I felt like a fraud, a complete fraud, like I was just a fake and all that. Well, that was my mood at the time. And so I didn't really know what to do with all that, except for feel really terrible. Well, over time, you know, I worked out a lot of wounds. I went to therapy. Um, I've been to neurofeedback. I've done EMDR, DBT. I've done plant medicine, meditations, all kinds of workshops, etc. And I don't feel like that anymore. I actually feel quite different. And for me now, the instruction of my guru means something quite different. So... The reason why I think that what he gave me was a key is because of this. Because innately, naturally, when you strip away all the stuff, all the stories, all the baloney, my natural mood is of service. I want to give. I want to help others. I want to um, be a healing agent in this world. And I can tell you, I, I don't see people differently. I don't see like the politician or the judge or the policeman any differently than I see the person behind the McDonald's counter. I don't see the spiritualist, the vegan, the person who does meditation every day any different from the person who works at Costco and has no spiritual practice. To me, they're one and the same. And I'm also, I feel like I'm everybody's well-wisher, even those that, those that people absolutely hate I know there's a lot of animosity to some of our political leaders, to some of the leaders around the world, to some of the scientists right now because of the things that they're creating. I have no animosity towards them. I see them as myself. I realize that, you know, I have potential energy and so does everyone else. And if any one of us was put into a certain circumstance, we don't know the outcome of how we would live our life. You know, I'm sure that if any one of us were severely abused and put into situations that some of us are put into, we might act very different than we do now. You know, it's a blessing to have coping mechanisms, to have support, to have people who can encourage you. A lot of people, they don't have that. You know, they're stuck to deal with their own stuff. And yes, it's their karma and they're working through stuff out, etc. But for me, it really gives... Um, the ability to hold space for the wounding of others, you know, to really see that, that no, these are my brothers and sisters. They are just like me. I am no better than them. So because of that kind of view, I think that's why I was given that kind of grace. That kind of grace to be a rule breaker, I can go into places that other people can't. I can go into places, hang out with people, do things that, um, some of the saints and sages, whatever, some of my god brothers, they would never do that. You know, they would, they would be too afraid of going to a hellish position or something like that. But for me, I have no fear of that. For me, it's one and the same. Anyways, I don't want to go too far into that. I'm just giving you that as a reference point so you know where I'm coming from. Um, but that's my history. So, so shamanic gongs, how does, how, did, how does that become different? How do we do something different with that? Well, when I play the gongs, again, my intention is not to uh, simply have you relax, 
Okay, it's, it's to really shake things up. One of the natural things about gongs is when people are laying down and the gong is played, you can feel the surge of energy run through your body. It does not matter what you believe. You, don't, you can be an atheist. It doesn't even matter if you believe in spiritualism or not. That's what I love. It speaks to the person beyond words, beyond ideology, beyond knowledge, beyond thought. It really just gets in there. So I know that when I'm playing the gongs, and if I have intentions of doing certain things, that energy is being transmitted, trans, and just really absorbed in the listener. And, um, you know, that's, that's what I really uh, think is so magical about the gongs. It's a very powerful and potent instrument. So, to do shamanic gong playing, you know, um, is quite something. Most anybody can play a gong. We can pick up a mallet, right? We can pick up a mallet, strike the gong, make a sound. I would guess that probably 98% of you out there can do that already. That's the easy part. What I find is the difficult part is becoming the channel getting out of the way of our own thoughts, our own judgments, our own ideas. And it might sound easy, but it's really not. You know, um, let, me, let me ask you a question. If something happens to you, let's say someone does something to you um, that you don't like, or, you know, let's say they do something that's maybe, you know, they steal something from a neighbor. Automatically, most of us would judge them and say, oh, that guy is not cool. You know, he wasn't considerate. He took this and that. He's a, he's a jerk. He should go to jail. Well, that partially might be true, and there may be more to it than that, much more to it than we don't even know. You know, um, maybe his relative is dying and he needed to get money. Maybe his child is starving and he needs to do something. Maybe he has wounding. Maybe he is a crack addict, but he has deep wounding that has led them there. He was abandoned from his mother. He was abused by his father. He does not know how to function. So these things happen. Um, my point is, our judgments interfere with that channel. If we have judgments like that, it closes our heart. No longer are we open. No longer do we hold space for that person. So, you know, and, and to get out of that judgmental space is quite difficult because we're so accustomed to using our judgment. I mean, it tells us how to navigate. We're conditioned. Um, from our judgments on how to navigate. This is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad. But really, truthfully, it's all relative. And most of it is just a story. So the biggest thing about shamanic gong playing is becoming the clear channel, uh, leaving the mental plane, and trying to live in a more subjective reality. Um, most people live in what's called an objective reality, where they are, they are the lords of all they, per, they all, all they see. In other words, everything in their mind is utilized for their enjoyment, their own satisfaction. Uh, that's objective, uh, an objective view. So everything becomes the object of their enjoyment. I see the sun. It's something that I'm going to enjoy. I see the ocean. It's for my pleasure. I'm going to bathe in it and get enjoyment. Um, I see the pretty girl, okay? I'm going to look at her and receive enjoyment from that. That's all objectification, okay? Being objective, living in an objective view. Different than that is the subjective view. In the subjective view, you're not seeing yourself as a god. Even though you are part of the divinity, part of that god creation, you don't take the center stage. You don't you're not the one receiving all the juice. Actually, in subjective consciousness, you're giving. You're giving. You're nurturing. You're nurturing the divine. You're, you're nurturing the divine play. You're serving whatever needs to be served in the moment for the satisfaction of the whole. Okay? It's very, very different. And in the being a subject, it gives you full pleasure. Now, in third dimensional reality, being the subject is not very fun. That's how we have slave labor. That's how we have slavery. That's, you know, we look down upon people and, and that's because uh, we think that we're superior. We think we're better than, some men used to think they're better than women. 
uh, different colors would think they're superior to other colors. That's an all, all an objective uh, type of view. The subjective view has none of that. You know, we are the servants. We only serve. We serve what is divine. We serve love. We give ourselves. We put others before us when it's in service. That's subjective reality. So to cultivate a clear channel really requires a lot of inner work, and that's the key. That is the key. If you can clear your channel, then you have access to everything, okay? So anyways, enough about all that, and I want to show you a few things and give you a little demonstration. Oh, let me back up. Um, as I was learning the gongs, I had the opportunity to learn from someone who had some pretty intense uh, teachings. She was able to go to school, do some intensive training, and I was offered private lessons from this person, and I really considered it. I, you know, I wanted to play the gongs. I had an idea of what they could do, but I wasn't really sure until I dove in myself. But anyways, it was handed to me. I had the opportunity to do so. Also, I went to YouTube. Um, with a big appetite, really wanted to see what was going on out there. And there were gurus out there showing this with different mantras and things. There were professionals, orchestra people, all kinds of techniques and, and methodologies, etc. And when I really tapped into it um, to align with where I am and who I am, it was really clear. Don't pay attention to any of it. It might be good for some folks out there. So I'm not saying that it's... Um, not a bona fide and valid way of doing things. No, 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 no. If you want to learn the formal ways of things, it's absolutely value. But the, the thing that's important is to remember is form does not guarantee substance, okay? I'll give you an example. How many great classical musicians do you know? They can play perfectly. They can, they can read the notes, play music perfectly, okay? Hit every note, every slide, every accent just wonderfully, yet when you put them in a live situation, they have no idea on how to communicate what they're feeling inside with the audience. If you're a musician, you know what I mean. Classical um, instrumentalists are generally very difficult to play with in live settings because they have no, I'm sorry, I don't mean they have no heart, but they have no, they have no development in how to convey their heart. It's all, it's all up here. It's all cerebral. You know, and yes, they're playing their heart out, but they don't have improvisation skills. They don't know how to just create from the fly, from the, to pull out of the ether and create beauty in the moment to just be with what is. You know, so that's the difference. And so when I was given that instruction, I deliberately set aside all lessons that were offered to me and just uh, developed it myself. And to do that, I, I went to the gong with great honor, great respect, and just meditated and was open. What wants to be shown? What wants, how does this gong with me sitting here holding these mallets going to exchange energetically? How does this gong want to be expressed? What does this gong want me to do? We're in partnership here. How can we help heal? How can we facilitate service? So that was the question. And that was um, why I decided to approach it that way. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few little strikes and things just right now, just to kind of give you an idea, since we're showing you how to play the gong. And then I'm going to give you a little demonstration. Okay, so again, I'm not going to teach you technique. I'm only showing you a few things to show you um, some basic things, like what a strike is, what a friction mallet does, etc. But really, if you really, really want to find out who you are, do that. Find out who you are, okay? Get yourself your mallets, get yourself your tools, etc. If you have any other tools that aren't even uh, shown in this video, grab them. Um, you know, of course, you need to be mindful and it has to be logical. You don't want to bring a hammer to this thing, of course, you know. I, I mean, in most cases, you don't want to do that. Um, <clears throat> but be open-minded. Go past those boundaries. So... I'm going to show you the first concept that they teach, or one of the concepts they teach for all gong players, is warming up the gong. And it starts with a, just a touch. You know, it's almost inaudible. And what that touch does, it warms up the gong. It lets the gong know that you're coming. It's kind of like, um, 
you know, when you approach uh, intimacy, you start off slow, you start off gently in most cases. You start off, you know, with some consideration, some delicateness, some sensitivity. Same thing with the gong. You know, let the gong know you're coming. Okay? And, and that's, uh, that's something that they teach. So this is one of the basic mallets that they use. There are several types. This is a soft-headed mallet. This is a hard-headed mallet. It has a different type of feel. Okay, where this soft mallet, listen to this feel. You can hear the difference with the hard mallet. You can actually hear the, the first strike, tongue, tongue. With this one, it's very muffled, almost inaudible. And that can be very beneficial. In some of the things I do, when I play, I'm playing it inaudibly, so you can't really hear the strike, but what you hear is a, a coming like a train. So it sounds like something like this. Another type of mallet, this is also a hard mallet, but this one's beat up because of um, the way I've been using it. And I'm just going to show you a little something that's something that came to me. And it kind of, to me, it sounds like a marching song or a marching uh, type of movement. So sometimes during journey, when we're doing the sound healings and we create journey, sometimes I use this approach to create um, movement. So it goes like this. tell by this head that this mallet was not created for that and again I want to express go beyond their boundaries they'll tell you you can't do this and that ah, do what you need to do find yourself okay these are friction mallets here all these are friction mallets and how these work is by rubbing the head onto the gong I'll show you so I'm gonna press right here that deep rich tone notice the size of this head now I'm going to take this this friction mallet which looks a little different looks like an E and it's kind of thin and unusual shaped but listen to this tone it sounds almost like a whale isn't it so you can imagine the different types of sounds you can get with different friction mallets and the friction mallets really, um, they really give an experience. So if you haven't tried it, lay down and have someone do the friction mallet, actually the whole gongs with the friction mallets and, and see what that is for you. Okay. Something else I wanna point out right now is that these mallets are considered, like I said, as friction and, and you're not supposed to strike these mallets but I do of course so sometimes okay. something that I also found fascinating was that it's possible to implement sacred geometry using the gongs you can use patterns you can use geometric patterns to create your sound. There's all kinds of geometry that you can do with mallets. And um, anyways, it's something that I like to do. Um, I'm gonna show you one more thing before I give you a demonstration, which is something that I really enjoy. It's the combination of the friction mallet with the soft mallet. It goes something like this. Anyways, um, thank you for being here with me today. 
I really appreciate uh, you spending the time to learn this shamanic path of the gongs and thank you for investing in time in your, your own self. Um, we really need each other right now. The world is in a particular place and you know, we're at a crossroads. The old ways are kind of dying out and there's a lot of room for new opportunity. A lot of the, the young people are coming in with such light right now and new thoughts and new ways of doing things. And the older generations that were so stuck, they're dying off. So anything that any of you out there can do to help this movement, this growth, um, you know, to help people really find out who they are beyond the conditioning, beyond the mindsets, beyond all those stories, help people find who they are authentically beyond the condition. That's how we're going to make it through. If we don't, our planet's going to lose out and we're all going to suffer. So, I mean, I don't really think that, but you know, that is the narrative there. So, and it looks like we can, it looks like we can just blow ourselves right up. I think that we're, it's going to be a little different than that, but we need each other. So we need one another to hold space, to learn, to help, to heal, to give your hearts, give who you are. Okay. Thank you. I'm Rasa Priya with Maui Sound Healing, and you can see us at MauiSoundHealing.com. Um, and if you're on, ever in Maui, come, please come and say hi to us. We'd love to share sound healing with you. It's a very unique, dynamic experience. And thank you guys so much. Be well. Yum, 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 yum.